Well, thank you guys so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, I certainly want to thank Karina and the whole Creative Mornings Houston team for the invite to do this. And then Quinn and everybody at Cactus for opening early. As a matter of fact, uh, I did find out after I got here that Violet and Christina would have been off today <laughs> had it not been for this. So thank you guys very much for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, as Quinn said, I, I sold uh, a, quite a few Beatles albums to this place. I actually worked for the company that put this thing out. It, it came out long before I went to work for the company. <laughs> I'm old, but I'm not that old. Um, but you know, I, I will say this, as far as Cactus is concerned, if, if, if there is a musical treasure map in Houston, you're standing on the X right now. This is really where it begins in this area. And I had a lot of accounts spread out over a lot of areas. And they all know this was always my favorite place to come. So I'm thrilled to be able to welcome those of you that have never been here to Cactus. And I'd also like to point out it's raining again. So um, what, what I, when I was first asked to do this, and this was months ago, and she shared the topic, that the global topic was Muse. I remember thinking, what a really, really cool topic. But I had no idea why I thought it was a cool topic. And then months went by, and then really last week, you know, when we were supposed to do this, I started thinking about it. And I looked up the Webster's definition of it, and it was fine, it was simple enough. It's basically you're saying inspiration. But I wanted to add a little to it, because for me, you know, I can look at a painting and feel somewhat inspired, but I'm not gonna go out and buy a canvas and some paints and brushes and immediately go home and paint. So I'm not inspired at that level. So I felt Muse is really something or someone that inspires you to act. And, and to make you do something. And the other cool thing I, I, I realize is it's different for all of us. Mine is not yours. Yours is not anyone else's. And the cool thing is mine wasn't mine six months ago. And that one wasn't like 10 years ago. So it, it just kind of lives and breathes. And, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit on, on, on that here in a few, but I, I wanted to start with what my, my earliest one was and how it directed the path that I wound up taking. Um, when I was a little kid, you had comic book kids, you had cartoon kids. I was the music kid. It was all I cared about. Christmas, birthdays, all I would tell my parents is the list of, I'm going to date myself again, eight tracks that I wanted. My parents had this picture of me. I'm probably seven years old. I'm on my bed and I'm wearing headphones the size of my head. <laughs> They're just massive, but all strewn around my bed are these eight tracks. And if you look really close, it's like Stevie Wonder songs in the key of life. It's like, I had good taste in music as a kid. I had relative, I mean, I had some garbage in there as well. But music was just my passion and it's all I cared about. It's all I wanted to do. And then something happened when I was 11 years old that just slammed it into overdrive. Now I was 11 years old in 1979. So if you think about what would happen to a kid in you know Fort Worth, Texas at that age in 1979 what could what could have happened that made me just obsessed with music I saw Kiss and my very strict very conservative parents allowed me to go with friends to go see Kiss and I mentioned like the comic book kids and the the super this was for me this was seeing Superman this was seeing Batman this was bear in mind I'm 11 but these aren't like people dressed up. This was the real thing. They were actually there in front of me and it was an absolutely life-changing experience. When I got my hearing back two days later, uh, all I wanted to do was tell everybody about it and I started going to concerts all the time. And music just became, it, it just became the only thing I thought about. Uh, horrible, horrible musician. Couldn't play anything to save my life, but I knew I somehow had to get involved in it. And so, as I got older and older, I, I wound up deciding that I wanted to do this somehow for a living. And the first job I had that involved music at all was at a Best Buy. Now this was long before they had become the behemoth that they once were. And so I went and I applied and the only position I wanted was to work in music. That was it. I didn't want to work in any other. Oh, there's refrigerators to be sold. There's a, I didn't care about any of it. I wanted to work in the music department. I got a job, it was part-time, and I worked my way up to where I was full-time, then eventually I was transferred, made department supervisor of another store's music department. And then I found my next muse. I was at work one day and a guy had come in and he'd asked to see whoever was in charge of the music section. 
which was me. And so somebody came and got me and I, there was this guy, kind of cool dressed guy, had this really cool bag. And he introduced himself and he said he worked for a company called Polygram. Um, I see a few blank stares. Meanwhile, Quinn's in the back just going, Polygram, yeah. <laughs> Polygram was a pretty huge label uh, back in the day. It, it since was absorbed by Universal. But this guy came in and in this bag, he started handing me all these CDs. He said, here's a copy of this, here's a copy of this. And, okay, and then some t-shirts. And I was just, he's handing me all this and I can't figure out why he's doing it. And eventually I said, okay, why are you giving me this? And he said, well, I'm here to do some promotion for these artists and for these new albums that we have and I'm going to do some stock checks and some compliance checks. I didn't know what that meant. I said, what do you mean a compliance check? He says, well, the, the different titles that we have on sale and positioned here, I just have to make sure you did it. And I said, oh, okay, so when we put something on sale, you're paying us to do that. And he said, yes. And so that's where I found out what co-op advertising was. And that was my first clue as to how the record business worked. I said, okay, now I kind of get what's going on here. And the more time I spent with him, he stayed with me for about 40 minutes. This guy became my muse. He is all I wanted to be. And so the cool thing was I didn't know how to get there, but at least I knew where I wanted to go. I wanted to be this guy and I couldn't shake this guy to save my life. And he had told me that every major label had an office in Dallas and that just, I was gobsmacked by that. I thought every, they, they're just in New York, they're just in LA. No, they all have an office here in Dallas. So I started kind of reaching out to some of them. And some are just absolute, they're like Fort Knox, trying to get in there, you know, because I visited a couple of them. And there's a couple you could talk to some people. And I finally met a few people who kind of put me on the path for how to get a job at a record company. And it really involved retail but it involves the right retail. It's gotta be a bigger or an influential place, a place kind of like where you're in now. It wasn't gonna happen in Best Buy. So, and I should also point out, this, this guy, that was a woefully entry level position. I mean, it really, really was. But Quinn's shaking his head. It, it really is, a, it's almost an intern-like position, but to me, it was like Walter Yetnikoff walked in and just held audience with me. I could have said Clive Davis, but I decided to go cooler on that. But um, so this guy became who I wanted to be and I, I worked and worked. And then after being at Best Buy for a while, I did what a lot of people do. I took a job for what seemed like a lot of money and went to go work for the federal government. Uh, nice, uh, for the General Service Administration. And I never shook the idea of, okay, I'm gonna do this to make more money but I'm still gonna pursue this because I can't get it out of my head. And so eventually I wound up going to work in the shipping and receiving department of a Virgin Megastore. And that's the worst gig you could have. Just, just it's, it really is. But I worked my way up and I went up where I was running that. Then I had gotten promoted to like a floor man. I wound up becoming the head buyer. And that's the one where everybody knows you. If you're the one actually buying all the music, you're actually the one getting all the free stuff. Everybody knows you, everyone. And so I decided to leverage that to try to get a job with one of these companies. And it wound up happening. I had interviewed with Warner Electric Atlantic. I had interviewed with uh, BMG and I had interviewed with EMI. And EMI was Virgin Capital Blue Note. I think 23 labels we had at the time. And that was the position I took. So I, I followed my muse for a lot of years. It didn't happen quickly, but I followed it. And I got in there and I started pretty entry level and then I started getting promotions. I just, I had a knack for it. You know, I just, I knew that this is what I was supposed to do and I had a knack for it and I got, I got actually quite good at it and, and I did pretty well at it. Wound up getting transferred to Houston. And the thing about it was though, while I was doing very well and getting what I wanted, the strangest thing happened, I genuinely began to hate who I was turning into. Um, when you're in that industry, a lot of things are made available to you at zero cost and at almost zero accountability. And so I found myself becoming a little bit of a stereotype of that record guy that's just going out every single night. I tell everyone, I don't think I paid for a drink for 16 years. I couldn't have. I mean, it just, it was everywhere you went. And I really began to, I'd have fun at night 
But the next morning I'd wake up and, and say things to myself like, God, you're somebody's father. And you're doing this kind of stuff. In fact, that's my son right there. Um, and you, you begin to, to sort of recognize that you're kind of becoming pathetic. And certain people that you're working with, I mean, thankfully I had the constitution to survive it and to last you know, all those years, but I saw some people that didn't. And I, I kind of, as my career kind of started doing this, my personal life started doing this. I remember when I first interviewed uh, with Virgin, um, the guy that interviewed me, he asked me if I was married. I said, I am. He said, well, you're gonna be divorced within two years if you take this job. And I thought, well, that's an odd thing to say. He said, no, he said, I'm not telling you that for you. I'm telling you that for me so I don't have to feel bad. And I said, well, we got on pretty well. I, th I, th I think I'm going to be fine. We were divorced in a year. Uh, it's just not conducive to a good family life. You're on the road all the time. Uh, when you do come home, you're in no condition to parent, to do anything, really. So I wound up getting out of the record business and getting my life in order. I thought, I have to stop all of these things that I'm doing, and I've got to try to focus on getting, that's a, I mean, that's a, when that needle pegs this way, that's a tough thing to get it to go all the way the other way. And so I decided I had to do this, and I did, and I had to cut so many ties with so many people, so many things. And one of the things that I cut ties with was my muse, because I associated all the problems that I had with being in the music business. This is a horrible excuse. It had nothing to do with it. It was just me. But in my mind, I was in the record business, I was a record guy, that's why I was doing all these ridiculous things. And I will spare you the stories because you wouldn't believe them. But I had offers, I had options, and there were all kinds of different ways. I mean, I'd been doing this for a while, I knew a lot of people. And I turned down everything. And I decided to just completely turn off and ignore what was inspiring me. And I did it for years. And I, I, I focused on other things, but it was always sort of in the back of my head. And I started running this digital media company down in Clear Lake, and people said, well, you should put on a music festival. Don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, you should do this. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And then I got a phone call from a former uh, co-worker at Capitol, and he had booked Lou Graham from Foreigner to play a, an attorney's private party at the Hard Rock. And he needed somebody to handle the meet and greet, handle the artist, all these kinds of things. And he called me up. He said, I can't get into town to do it. He says, you've done a thousand of these. Will you please do it? And I was scared to death to say yes. But he needed the help, and so I agreed to do it. And so I went, and I handled it. It went, you know, I made it through. I remember the drive home. I was so proud of myself. I didn't, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't drink anything. I didn't do anything. I was so, I was so pleased with myself. And that's when I realized, my resolve was such that I could survive something like this. And that's also the part where I realized it really wasn't the music business that was responsible for my behavior, it was me. So I guess at that point I was a little open to it. And I started doing a couple of things here and there on occasion. I'd write a couple of album reviews. Or I would just, just I'd somehow just kind of dip my toe in it. And then a really good friend of mine, uh, and now business partner, uh, we started doing these different events together. And he was really pushing the idea of doing a radio station. He wanted to start a digital radio station. Now he's really, really into talk radio. I mean, that's his passion. I think it's fine. I, you know, I enjoy some of it, but I have no real passion for it. For me, it was the music side. And so he said, what if we did a hybrid? You be the music side of it and he'll take care of the talk. And so I will say this, when you spend a lot of years in the record business, you amass a ridiculous collection of music. And so I had just terabytes and terabytes and terabytes full of, of songs. And so we started creating this radio station, but it was effortless for me. I just was like, I just did it. And the station made no sense. It really didn't. We would play like a Tony Bennett song, followed by a Willie Nelson song, followed by a Tool song, just because it happens to be what my music collection is. And so finally somebody, uh, at Nextcast contact me and said, who are you trying to get to listen to this? Because I'm listening to it and it doesn't make any sense. And I thought, okay, so now I need to actually create blocks of radio. And so it's, it's kind of cool because you create something that is almost your own art by using other people's art. 
And so then I started creating these genre specific shows and I started, and so at this point now I'm finishing up our seventh station because I wanted to incorporate some, some country music into it too, but you can't do that. So we started a country station. Um, I do the station for the city of Kima. They have their, uh, their own official radio station and, and so I, I do that. And so I decided to start listening to what had guided me before and it, it just it it just made me so happy to do it. It's a lot of work. It's where, it's actually where the work is in doing internet radio is just building the thing because it's so tedious. It's so time consuming. It's just downloading files, uploading files, downloading artwork, uploading artwork. It just takes forever. But I made the decision to start listening once again to what had inspired me. And it's a little bit like if you ever had your ears pop and you didn't really know they were plugged up and they just kind of popping like, oh my God, I've just been, it was like that. I just realized how miserable I had been not being involved in it for a long time because I chose to turn it off and to stop listening to it. So I've done that and it's, it's been incredibly rewarding. I feel, I feel like I, I feel comfortable and I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. My, my parents would get onto me all the time when I was younger, but you gotta get out of the record business. It's what, it's what I do. It's like a dentist, you know, a dentist is a dentist. I'm a record guy. It's, I've been doing it my whole adult life. How do, you don't get out of that until you have to get out of it. But I, I finally found the joy of following what inspires me and I saw the mistake of ignoring it. I now see what ignoring it meant to me. And I, I had said earlier that it takes different forms. And then this is, this is, this is what, I'll, this is what I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with. Uh, at this point, my muse over the last several months had taken the form of a, of, of a, a woman, a, 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 you know, just an amazingly brilliant person. And, and life sometimes gets complicated. Mine probably got a little bit more complicated than most. But something happened five years ago and my youngest son and I had a falling out. He was 15 at the time and I didn't, we didn't speak. Uh, I was very, hey, you know, you get hurt and hurt eventually turns into resentment, which turns into anger, which turns into just, I'm going to shut this off. And so I hadn't spoken to my son or seen him for a little over five years. And I had gone to see this son do a play. And during the play, this person sent me a text and says, I, I need to talk to you when the play is over. And I said, all right. So I went over to her house and we sat in her backyard. And for about an hour and a half, she talked to me about her belief that I need to repair this relationship. Now, I gotta be honest with you, I've had at least 75 people say those exact same words to me. I mean, the entire conversation. I've had over and over and over again. But it was such a hard thing for me to do, and I was very resistant to everything. But when you meet that person who somehow can turn you know, your hardened heart into just mush, everything gets through. And I got home about 1.30 in the morning, and it was a really tough time, and, and I chewed on it and hemmed and hawed on it for a while. And at 2.30, I looked him up on Instagram and I sent him a message. And it just said something to the effect of, okay, here's the deal. The woman I love is under the impression that I need to address my feelings for you and repair this relationship, and I don't know how to do that. Send. Well, he wrote me back at five, and he said, I would really like that. And that was just a I could not really hold, because you don't know what you're going to get back, you know, I, there's no telling what's going to come back, if anything. And it was that, and so we wound up just chatting back and forth for about two hours. And it was silly stuff to be asking your own child. How tall are you? You know, what do you do? Where do you live? I didn't know where he lived. And it turns out he had moved uh, pretty far away, up to Granbury. And to make that long story short, earlier this week, we drove up there and I saw him for the first time in five years. I heard his voice for the first time in five years. It's different. His voice had changed dramatically. And I realized at that point that if I just follow what and who inspires me, 
I can't go wrong. Now, this wasn't something I wanted to do. I didn't want to do this. I was very, I was very resistant to it for a long time. And so I'll just, I'll just, I'll leave you with this. I genuinely believe everybody here, and my, we all have a muse. We all have a person or a thing that inspires us to act. Act on it. Just try it. You don't, I mean, you don't have to. You can ignore it if you want. I did it for a long time. But I genuinely believe if you do, it's not going to take you where you want to go. We like where we want to go. It fits our narrative. That fit my narrative really well. I'm the, the, the heartbroken dad whose son wrong. It just, it just fit. But while it won't take you where you want to go, I really do think it's going to take you where you need to be. And I think it's worth taking a chance on and just saying, I, I feel this deep and I'm going to follow it and see where it takes me. In my experience, it's taken me great places. The only time that it was not great, that's on me. It had nothing to do with what was inspiring me. It had nothing to do with my muse. I thank you guys for your time and your attention. It's been an honor to share a little bit of my story with you. Thank you so much.